In the matter of the people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson, case number BA 097. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Hi, Taylor. Hello. Did we decide that I'm no longer qualified to do the intro? Um, sure. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Doom to Fail. My name is Taylor, joined here by FARS. We're the podcast that brings you history's most notorious disasters and epic failures two times a week. And FARS, I think you go first today. But let's banter a little bit first. Let's banter a little bit. So okay. tell me about your weekend. Um, my friend Agnes is here, listener and friend Agnes. So we've been hanging out yesterday. I was exhausted. So they let me sleep and they all went to the pool and I'm baking some bread. Just a good hang. What kind of bread? Um, it's like this, it's like a fake hala. Cause like a hala takes like nine hours. So it, it's like similar to a hala, but it takes like two hours. The poor man's hala or yeah. at least the efficient cooker's hala. Yeah. Um, I went earlier, and next time you visit, Taylor, I got to take you to this pastrami shop next to my house. It, or it, Well, it's a deli, but I got the pastrami sandwich. It is – actually, you know what? You're from New York, or you lived in New York, so you probably wouldn't like it. I was in a pastrami club in L.A. Really? Um, where we went to like a bunch of different Jewish delis and stuff. It was great. I would say that it is the best pastrami sandwich I've had since leaving L.A. and not being able to get Cantor's. But Cantor's was still better. And even at that level, I think that your experience with New York Jewish delis is probably – Leaps and bounds above Cantor's. Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. But still, if it's a good one, it's a good one. That's not, there you, go. you know. We're not precious about our sandwiches. Yeah. Um, so, Taylor, I'm going to go first today. And, yes. you know, I don't actually even know where my notes are. <laughs> <laughs> There's so, so many, so, good. so many monitors up at this moment. There we go. I know. Okay, I have I so many it. monitors. So I'm going to do two stories today, but they're kind of abbreviated. <laughs> it's still going to be kind of long ish, but it's going to, it's like, I, I cut the content down quite a bit. So, okay. so I started out by the most doomed to fail thing I can think of that sounds innocuous, innocuous, but isn't that innocuous, which is units of measurement. But cool. if you confuse units of measurement, bad things happen. Okay. But then okay. I got into my second topic, or actually the first topic in order here, and um, and I thought it was a units of measurement issue, and I started researching it, and I was like 90% done, and I was like, shit, this was not a unit of measurement issue. <laughs> it Tell was me just, anyway. It was just a goof em up. So I'm going to do the, uh, you know what, I'll start with the unit of measurement problem first, and I'll go into the second, the second non-one that is not part of the topic later. Okay. Um. So... The first one I want to get into has to do with NASA. You know what? Actually, they both have to do with NASA. Whatever. NASA has a huge issue when it comes to units of measurement and not yeah. screwing them up. Have you... Wait. Are you going to talk about the people that are stuck on the space station right now? No. So they flew a... Well, that was from... Boeing, though, wasn't it? Exactly. Like, you have to be brave to get on a Boeing airplane. If you're getting on a Boeing spaceship, you have to be unbelievably brave because they like canceled it a bunch of times. And now I think they can't get back. Yeah. Those people's spouses took out trillion dollar life insurance policies when they <laughs> signed up for this mission. Oh, you want to take a Boeing fucking spaceship to space? Cool. You, I'm going to start giving your clothes away as soon as you leave. No kidding. <laughs> no kidding. So Not coming home. I am. Um, it's funny. I, I started doing this research and I was focusing on this one, one, uh, one mission and it just segued into mission after mission after mission i was like this thing doesn't just happen as a fluke it's like mission after mission after mission like all very nervous happens all the time and, yeah and i think i kind of know why so I, there's two things i'm going to attribute it to one i'll i'll actually discuss in this in this issue with which is bureaucracy so i think that when things get super bureaucratic uh your capacity to make any changes like an individual person within that organization is limited and as cool as I think NASA is in the mission and the people that how smart they are that work there, it also feels like a really weird, stupid, gross bureaucratic government entity that like is just like very bleak and gray and just like, did you follow your TPS report? It just feels yeah. really crappy. Um, something else that I, I happen to know that I love is that when NASA was first started, it was called the NASA. Isn't that fun? So dorky. Isn't that fun? 
I guess it's fun, sort of. <laughs> also, like, all you have to do is watch Paul 13 and look at um, Ed Harris wearing, like, a button-up white shirt with, like, no sleeves, but, like, a black tie on with his, like, crew cut. And you're like, what? why are we doing this? Like, we don't have to look like this. We can actually be, like, cool and fun and edgy. But, like, they're not like that. And that's part it of the problem. It was 60s, though. Everyone looked I like guess that nobody was edgy then. That's a good point. Everyone wore it. That's, like, the 60s outfit. I, I think I'm thinking about the Moon Rover guy. Remember the Moon Rover guy who had like his he- part of his head was shaved, or he colored his hair red, white, and blue. Remember that? He was an Iranian no. guy. That's why he stood out to me. I don't remember, but that's fun. Um, so that's one of the reasons. The other reason is that it sounds like NASA has to hire a ton of different companies to get anything done. Mm-hmm. Like one company builds this thing, one company builds that thing. They all kind of come together and assemble it somehow. Exactly. Um, and that seems to cause issues as well because you're dealing with units of measurement that they might be interpreting differently. So mm-hmm. we're going to get into a 1998 slash 1999 failed mission. One of many that is called the Mars climate orbiter, which was um, part of NASA's Mars global survey program, which the entire point of was to survey the climate and atmosphere around Mars. Because even back in 98, we were talking about potentially one day having to populate Mars. So this is not a new new thing that we just kind of cooked up. This has been going on. Actually, this was devised in the late 80s, and this launched in 90, uh, 98. So That's, um, do you think we're ever going to actually live on Mars? My, my guess is absolutely not. We have to. We have to, because I researched it. Dude, space is incredible, Taylor. Like, you should really, <laughs> you should really get into space. I've- I'm into space. I've researched space. I was Taylor, I learned a lot about space volcanoes. But I'm just saying I don't know if we're going to really ever go. In 4 billion years, our galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy collide. We're like we, everything that's that we know of, actually Mars will be a part of that. So, it, yeah, yeah. Getting to Mars and having to live there is like I think it's like V1 of learning how to just be intergalaxial or whatever. I don't know. I I don't think um I think that's the great filter. I don't think we're gonna get there. You can. We're all gonna die. Yeah. Well, you heard you heard from first from Taylor. Um. Anyways, that was the entire point of this climate orbiter. So it was um also supposed to serve as a communication relay for a thing called the Mars Polar Lander. I've already kind of foreshadowed this a little bit. I'll get to what happened to that mission in a moment, but we'll move on. <laughs> it was. It was designed off of another device called the Mars Observer, which it was very similar in in kind of design, the launching mechanisms, all that stuff. Um, and uh, that thing, the Mars Observer, it launched five years earlier. That was also lost by NASA in Mars's orbit. It, 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 this goes on. This goes I mean, on it seems easy time. to lose things in space. No, it shouldn't be this easy. I mean, if you... If you have like a 50% failure rate, if if 50% of the planes you got on crash, you wouldn't fly. If 1% of the planes crash, you wouldn't fly. No, I know. I don't think you would. Um, so it was um, go ahead. I mean, no, you're totally right. I definitely wouldn't, but um space is like incomprehensibly huge. Continue. I know, but just don't do it then. Like, don't do it until you know exactly whatever. What, who am I to talk? I, I can't. I don't even know what we're hearing about. I literally, I literally have trouble changing the filter on my uh, on my little water filter thing that's attached to my faucet. I bought so a new I one mean, recently, so like I'm really excited about it. I'll share. I'll tell you about it later. Please, we can do we can do another episode on that. Perfect. Um. So this thing, the orbiter, it was developed and engineered by JPL, uh, the Jeff Bolshan Lab, and built by Lockheed Martin and launched on December 11th, 1998. That's not the eventful part. Because once it launches, it takes forever to get to where it's going, and that's when you realize everything's wrong. So it launches on December 11th of 1998. On September 23rd, 1999, so three, 286 days after it launched, it started to approach Mars. Uh, the way they do this, I had to do a ton of research into how things are launched into orbit, which is like, this stuff is so incredible, Taylor. So the way the way it works is that when you launch something and you're trying to line up with its orbit, you basically are slingshotting yourself around it. And yeah, then yeah. The, the gravity is pulling you closer to the orbit. But the thing is, the trick shot is you need to match the velocity at which that orbit is rotating you can't overshoot it you can't undershoot it so 
What that essentially means in this case is that this thing was in outer space flying towards Mars at 194,000 miles per hour. Crazy number, right? That's terrifying. It had to break, apply reverse thrusters to get it down to 52,000 miles per hour as it's approaching Mars' orbit, line up parallel to the orbit, and then slowly just merge into it like traffic. Like traffic, right? Like the fastest yeah. traffic humanly or you can ever possibly imagine. So crazy. And, yeah. and, and that's the thing. You, re- you look at the stuff like that, and you're like, okay, these people, like, it's got to be really hard to do what they're doing. So maybe... Oh, no, we're not saying that the people at NASA aren't smart. Dumbasses. <laughs> um, <laughs> they smart. I could, I could do what they do. Um, <laughs> so on this day in September, things are looking fine as the orbiter was slowly starting to align itself with Mars' orbit. And for a brief period of time, it was planning on losing communication with the Earth as it goes behind Mars. That's just like naturally when that ends up happening. Mm-hmm. So... At this point is when they realize that something went wrong. So imagine this thing has been flying at 194,000 miles per hour for 286 days. They figured out, this is the amount of precision these guys have. They figured out that they lost communication 49 seconds earlier than they should have. After this thing traveled 14 billion miles, whatever that comes out to. I'm so nervous. And I like, like I'm sweating. I'm so nervous. I hate this. Keep going. Well, that's where the, the, the story of, on this piece ends because it lost, uh, it went behind Mars 49 seconds earlier than it should have, never to be heard from again. Nope. What? Done. It's gone. So <laughs> it's got to be, it's going to be so, can you imagine dedicating so much of your life to this thing and then all of a sudden it's just, that's it, it's gone? Like, what do you I, do? I know. I want to throw up. And I think that, um, because, like, when you watch NASA, when, like, something goes well and everybody's so excited, you're like, I wish I was ever that happy at work, you know? Seriously. But But you're like, I guess, like, the lows are low. The also, highs that, are high. also, that was a trick question, Taylor. What you do if you're that guy or gal is you go to Chili's and get a margarita. Oh, I love Chili's. There you go. That's exactly what you do. So, an investigation was launched to figure out how on earth a $193 million project, the equivalent of nearly $400 million today, was lost. This is like a consistent theme. Anytime you research these things, the, co- the Congress does not like funding NASA. <laughs> like, like consistently across its entire history, they've not been pro funding NASA. And so when they lose money to this degree, it's always like, what just happened? And first off, I don't even know why you were spending this money to begin with. Now I know that even the thing that you thought was valuable out of it, you're not going to get out of it. So explain to us what happened. So they did. What they found out was that Lockheed Martin had used U.S. customary units as its calculation for the total impulse produced by thrusters. I'm going to talk about that in more in a minute. Okay. Versus what NASA used, which was the metric unit. That's what NASA always uses, the metric unit. So an impulse unit is the change in momentum of an object. So when you slam like a, a, a tennis ball or a golf ball, the momentum shift one way or the other is an impulse unit. And if you measure it differently, then it has obviously different ramifications. So the outcome was that the orbiter ended up applying a lot more propulsion to insert itself into that orbit. Like I said, it has to kind of slow itself down and then start, uh, you know, uh, what, what would you call it? merging? It had to mm-hmm. merge into the orbit traffic and it applied a lot more of that sideways thrust than it should have because of that miscalculation based on what's called U.S. customary, imperial system is called U.S. customary unit versus metric units. Okay. Makes make sense? Yeah. Ish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Actually, I've been thinking about doing like an episode on like why things are different. Like, why why do we do this? And like, why do sometimes people drive on the left side of the road? And like, why does paper d- different sizes in Europe? Like all those kind of things. I would love to brainstorm things to cover. Yeah. Why mm-hmm. is ice such a luxury in Europe? Why do you why do you only get one packet of ketchup at, at the McDonald's in Germany? Yeah. These things we need to figure yeah. out. 100%. Um so what what they think ended up happening is that as this thing went behind Mars, it propelled itself through the orbit and then just started running itself into the ground. They assume 
that it basically imploded or exploded about 35 miles um, above Mars's surface, um, mm-hmm. where it would have. Where it's assumed that that's where you would have impacted the thick atmosphere of Mars and probably caused it to disintegrate. So, ultimately, NASA actually blamed itself for not double checking the math, and again so stupid they had two engineers who were like the math is wrong (laughs) the math is obviously wrong and they're like no no you didn't follow the form so it doesn't fucking matter the math is wrong go follow form and then maybe we'll consider this like everyone should be in trouble and i mentioned earlier the mars pole lander so this thing actually launched two months after this was all part of this exploratory program that nasa was launching so there's a bunch of these things being launched in succession and so they launched this thing, the Mars Polar Lander, two months after. So around um, November of that same year. So this thing destroyed itself in September of 99. In November of 99, it had arrived in that same um, area. And that was also lost. And what they assume happened to that one around the same th- around the same place that they, it was supposed to enter into orbit is is it, um, it went through to land on uh, – it was supposed to land on the surface – there was a known vibration that would happen when this thing was entering into Mars's orbit. And that vibration would cause the computer software to think that it was actually touching down and landing on the surface when it wasn't. Mm-hmm. And so what happened was they think that this thing went through the um, orbit and the vibration happened, causing a software bug to present itself. And it didn't descend to the ground the way it was supposed to. It assumed it was already on the ground. So there was no arresting mechanism to slow its descent and it just crashed into the ground so there goes another about 400 million dollars so um that's two pretty fun events one thing i didn't mention is that uh we got our the imperial system is actually based off the uk weights and measures act and we Mm -hmm. just call it something different than they do but it's the exact same thing so the uk still uses that that's us the uk doesn't use the metric system no, I mean, not according to what I research. You know what the most wild thing is, is that they use stone for like a measurement of weight, but it means 14 pounds. So they'll be like, oh, I gained two stone. And you're like, why would you have to add by 14 anyway? So they, so the UK adopted the metric system in the 60s and 70s. But they still use uh, okay. It's one of okay, this. You can add this to your list of things of why do they do things the way they do things because some things, some units of measurement are metric, some are not, some are imperial. So, um, just wildly confusing. Also, the UK uses dry weight measurements called bushels and pecs. That's what I'm talking about. Like, the fuck is that? What is a that? Bushel? Is something from a goddamn nursery rhyme? UK. Yeah, get with the program, UK. I, t- I do tell the children all the time. I love them a bushel and a peck and two kisses on the neck. Do you but, really say um, that? Yeah, I don't know where they came from, but I say that to them all the time. And I like, especially when they were babies, and they would like be like kissing them on the neck. Anyway, that is very cute, actually. Yeah. Um. So the other story I have, it's also NASA related, and this one's probably a little bit more well known. And this is the one where I researched. I got to the very end of the research. I was like, shit, that's not why it, it went wrong. So I'll, let, me, let me explain real quick. So I'm going to talk about the Hubble's um, telescope. So, uh, again, everybody knows that what the Hubble telescope is. Basically, uh, it's just a very, very large telescope that's in outer space. Um, it's in Earth's orbit. So, it's about 340 miles or so above the surface of the Earth. Um, originally, I don't think I knew that. Oh, did you think it was further out? I think I thought it was on Earth. No, no. It's if in I had to guess, I would have been like, it's on Earth. Not that yeah. it's on Earth. Yeah, no. So there's a reason why it's in outer space. So basically, there was a astronomer in 1946 called Lyman Spitzer who was like, "Hey, we can. We're never going to actually be able to understand and see what's outside of what's what's in outer space if we don't get off Earth." And the reason for that is because there's a thing called atmospheric turbulence on Earth, and so that causes issues with our visibility into outer space. So, for example, when you see a star twinkling. That's atmospheric um, turbulence. That star is not actually twinkling. Right. That's just because the, the the light getting to us and like things going and being in the way. Being refracted by our atmosphere. Yeah. So in this yeah, thing, yeah. you can't see it, but I'm doing a little wavy thing. They get so, it. Um, so basically, like, like I said before, like when when anytime NASA seems to do something, a treme- like 
Congress doesn't like approving this stuff. So a ton of energy and effort went into trying to get the Hubble uh, Space Telescope up and running. Like there was mm -hmm. um, astronomy associations, lobbying groups. There's different countries that were involved in it to help fund part of it. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, they ended up securing about $36 million from Congress in 1978 to start building the telescope, which is like a drop in the bucket of what it actually ends up costing. But that being said... I pulled some schematics on how this thing works and I'm just going to admit to you and anyone listening. I don't understand how cameras work. <laughs> I'm like, laughing because like, I like the idea that you understand how schematics work of anything. And then like, <laughs> I, don't understand how cameras work. <laughs> I don't like, either. I have no fucking idea. So please. What is it capturing my soul? Like, what does it do? Like, how does and it? And I know that, like, me? I did. Do you ever make a pinhole camera in school? No. You like get like a piece of like photographic paper and like a pinhole, and then like a it makes an image. But like, I don't know. We had a dark room in in seventh grade, and I remember being in there a couple times. But um, no, I don't. I don't get it either. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'm. So people, if anybody understands how cameras work, please tell us. That's one <laughs> one thing I thought was like I was like, if you send me back to like the 1500s i would know nothing i i couldn't invent a car i couldn't create a match i don't i, don't, I wouldn't exactly. know how any of this stuff works like the thing like oh i'm gonna go back and invent things i'm not gonna fucking invent anything i'm not gonna invent the telephone i'm gonna be like i swear to god you guys there's something we could do where we could talk to each other and the people, people would be like you're a witch or you're crazy and put me in a dungeon and like that would be it yeah, i could totally see us like doing this like going back to the 1500s it's like we're gonna invent a telescope and then it eventually <laughs> whittles its way down to like we just like invent scissors and even those barely work i know exactly what, oh you guys already have wheels okay what else what else <laughs> can we work on <laughs> we'd be done a dog leash our dogs pets <laughs> yet they are not pets okay no too bad. so the original launch date for hubble was october of 1986 but nasa was having some other challenges in 1986 namely that the space shuttle challenger was destroyed and killed all the pilots on it or astronauts on it in January of that year. So basically everything NASA related, all their operations came to a halt so they could explain to Congress what went wrong in that situation. Um, as a result, Hubble basically sat in storage for about four years where it would be basically tested, powered on and off to make sure its systems were in good working order. It would have updates added to it throughout the process. Ultimately, it would cost around $6 million a month to store this Gosh. thing, which yeah, it goes back to like what I mentioned earlier, the $32 million that they budgeted, allocated for this was really, really cute in 1978. So in April, on April 24th of 1990, it was launched in the cargo hold of the Discovery Space Shuttle. So it launched, um, like I mentioned earlier, it launched in Earth's orbit, so not that far out. Um, I said 340 miles above the surface, actually 336 miles above the surface. And... Over its first few weeks, they basically just like turned it on and off and would run tests, calibrate its stuff. There was a lot of stuff that goes into it. Again, science, science, cameras, science. So <laughs> on, on May 20th, it went, it sent back its first image. And immediately, scientists noticed a problem and it wasn't hard to, to observe the problem. So if you ever look up Hubble's first images, you'll see that it's basically refracting light in a very obvious way. It's like if, I'm trying to think of like a way to describe. Okay, so if you like move your, if you're trying to take camera uh, a picture and you move your camera around while you're taking a picture, it kind of like reflects, yeah. reflects light in that way. That's kind of what they look like. So, um, so basically, what they realized looking at these images was that there was an issue with the mirrors within the camera on Hubble that they had to address. Given the level of precision we're talking here, it is imperceivable what might have. It is imperceptible to human eyes what was wrong with the camera, but basically what it meant is that the mirror that was responsible for refracting the light out of the light source was off by 2,200 nanometers. For context, a human hair is 1,000 nanometers thick. Jesus. A red blood cell is 7,000 nanometers thick. So this is like a third of... It's so it's crazy. I think the yeah. Yeah. Perception precision these guys need so anyways that's the scale we're talking about what they discovered during the inquiry was that they're again they outsource all this stuff so they hired a, a manufacturer called perkin elmer uh, which is still around today um and they were the the manufacturer responsible for creating the mirror so they had used a device called a reflective null corrector 
to measure and ensure the surface area of the mirror was smooth within the appropriate tolerance levels that NASA had defined for them. Mm -hmm. So let's figure out what a reflective null corrector is. Let me go ahead and put my science <laughs> I hat know, on. I already, I already know what that is. You don't have oh, to explain okay, it. Okay, we'll skip totally it fine. then. We'll skip it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so basically, what you do is you put the mirror on the ground. Probably not on the ground. You, it's a very expensive mirror. You do something with it. Put <laughs> this thing, this null corrector, is a device that is positioned on top of the mirror. And there's a pinhole on the top of it. And there is... I said pinhole. But you did. You did. Mm -hmm. That was related to something totally different, but we're going to we're gonna bypass that. Whatever. It's round. Within this device are all kinds of lenses that reflect light back and forth amongst each other until they deposit that light source back out into the side called a deflector, which is the observable place you would look at to see if this thing is correctly um, smooth enough. So at the top... You have a laser that shoots through that pinhole and then does this reflection reflection, and then pass it back to the deflector. So if everything is great, what you see is just a normal ray of light. If you're looking at the def deflector, all you see is a normal ray of light. If it's not okay, if it's off by the tension levels that are being defined by the, the designers, then... You get that wavy look, you know, like when you were a kid, you would see like channels that you weren't supposed to be watching on, on TV. Like it would just be like kind of yeah, wavy yeah. and kind of up and down. Uh, it would it would show up like that. And so that would be the clear indicator that you were off on your smoothness level. So the thing that happened was that they used multiple null connect, uh, um, sorry, multiple null correctors while they were measuring this thing. So upon final inspection, they decided to use a totally different new untested reflector that they built themselves. So throughout construction, they were using these like pre-made, prefab, whatever uh, reflectors. Mm -hmm. And then when it gets to the final thing, like we need to be the best we can possibly be. This is NASA. We got to do the top work we can possibly do. We're going to create our own to be as perfect as possible. When mm -hmm. they realized that the lenses inside that thing we're off by 1.3 millimeters. So if you were looking at the deflector, you saw a straight light beam of light, but you didn't know that inside the thing that was displaying that beam of light, there was this malady. Right. So NASA set to trying to find a solution. And the problems were to replace the same mirror in space would be impossible. Literally, just logistically, it would have been impossible to do it. Yeah. So bringing the telescope back to Earth to replace it was cost prohibitive. So what they decided to do was we know how off we are on the mirror itself. So why don't we just install another mirror that just counters that imbalance, that aberration? Yeah. yeah. And what they devised was this thing called a corrective optics space telescope axial replacement. Cool. <laughs> called CoStar, which is really cool. <laughs> <laughs> and so and so that was built and devised to uh compensate for the aberration in the existing mirror so on december 1993 the mission was mounted to fix the mirror this was super risky so right does someone have to go someone has to go do it someone has to go do it so in orbit Jeez. maintenance was not the standard for nasa the risks associated with it were crazy and as i described they've already lost like a space shuttle 14 different uh, Mars lander, like a lot of things have gone wrong, so they don't want to risk this, especially because if risking it means you can lose an, a human being or equipment to deep space, and there's no recovery mechanism, but you don't get that person back. That. Yeah, I hate it. I hate it. I was thinking, Taylor, is that would you rather? Did I ask you this already? Would you rather die that way or in like that uh, Titanic um, submarine? I feel like maybe in a Titanic submarine because it just happens so fast. Like, what do you do? You just drift away until you starve to death? Or you run out of oxygen? I would assume run out of oxygen or die of thirst. That's really scary. I mean, maybe it's beautiful and you, like, get really introspective when you're out there, but no, I hate it. <laughs> they have to give those guys, like, cyanide capsules, right? Oh, yeah. Actually, that's a really good point. They have to. There's no way they're like, yeah. listen, Bill, I need you to go walk into outer space, and if yeah. you're knocked off... There was one story I read where they had to repair a satellite and 
the ways they were trying to catch it wasn't working. So an astronaut literally just held on to the space shuttle with one arm and then grabbed the satellite with his other arm and pulled them together. I was like, this is insane. What a job. Insane. That is insane. So, um, okay, well, there we go. Uh, listeners, let us know how you'd rather die in deep space or under the ocean. So, Oh, my God. Uh, since they needed to basically do this mission anyways, um, they decided they were going to upgrade some components with the Hubble. Um, and ultimately, the mission was a su- success because on January 13th, the h- first incredibly high-quality images of the Hubble will come back. Um, and so, yeah, 1999, January 13th. I mean, we were kids back then, but it was a momentous kind of human uh, accomplishment that this ended up happening. From there on out, several other missions to maintain Hubble were undertaken until, again, the 2003 Columbia disaster where the space shuttle burned up on reentry. Um, mm. By that point, plans were already uh, in place to eventually replace Hubble with what would later become known as the James Webb Telescope. Um, it was predicted there would be a gap in uh, observable signs through telescopes between the decommissioning of one and the commissioning of the other, but uh, that's not the case. So the operational life cycle of Hubble was supposed to be 15 years. That's it. It's still functioning. It's 30 years on, and it's still sending back images. And it is, it is pretty incredible. It sent us some incredible stuff. It is the reason why we now know that there is a black hole in the middle of our galaxy. Um, it is the where we have learned about how galaxies are born and collapse. It took the first document a picture of a star being essentially born. That's called the Pillars of Life, if you've ever seen that image. And one other thing I learned is that it's this stuff is so crazy, Taylor. So I think we've all heard that the images that we see from Hubble or James Webb or whatever, that's actually not the real images that NASA has to kind of colorize them and make them kind of look mm-hmm. a certain way. So that's sort of true. Were you gonna say something? Well, I just I looked at a bunch of the Hubble telescope pictures while you were talking, and they're beautiful. They're crazy beautiful. Yeah. Oh my god. So here's here's actually what's going on. So I learned I didn't write any of this down, so I'm going off memory here, and you know how good my memory <laughs> is. So I learned that human eyes can only perceive 0.4 percent of visible color. So there's so many things going on around us that we can't actually see. Sorry, I say visible color. I should have said visible light, which is equivalent to color. So so when we say that NASA has to kind of colorize these things, otherwise, like this isn't what what it really looks like, half true. So what happens is both with Hubble pictures and with James Webb, So in Hubble's case, Hubble only captures pictures in black and white. And the reason for that is that if you apply gradients to black and white images, you actually pick, you can pick up a lot more contrast than you can if you capture them like in full color as perceived by humans. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what they do is they take black and white pictures and colorize them as they actually would be observed by human eyes. If you were to view them. So you would, you, when you look at a Hubble picture, it is true that that picture isn't authentically the picture Hubble took, but if you saw the thing that Hubble saw, you would see it with your own eyes as it is produced by NASA. Say that again. So the pictures Hubble takes always come out black and white. Okay. We, what NASA then does is they apply gradients to the level of black and white in the shades of gray that are on the image and then overlay them with visible light colors. So if you were to see that object, like pillar of light, have you seen pillar of life yet? No. Okay. Google pillar of life. Is that a picture? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. It's one of the most famous pictures that Hubble ever took. That's the birth of a star as it's being captured in in real time. And If you were to see that with your own eyes, that's what it would look like. But if you were to see the the Hubble picture of it, it would actually be all black and white. Got it. So, I I see one. so the so another example of that is James Webb. So James Webb is uh I want to say 1900 or 19 million uh sorry, 1.9 million miles away from Earth. It is way further out in deep space. 
it is different than Hubble because it actually is set to capture light on the um, ultraviolet band mm -hmm. uh, wavelengths. And so what it can do is it can see through clouds. So where Hubble can't see through clouds, it can kind of see what's directly in front of it. Um, James Webb can. And so, again, everything we see from James Webb is run through the similar filter because our eyes can't see ultraviolet. So that's crazy. Yeah, it's nuts. How do you, it's I, just like how, wild. I just don't even understand. I don't understand. Like I, I know you said it like twice, but it's like, it's so crazy to think that there's like other things happening that I am not seeing. Yeah. So one of the other happening. things, one of the other things that Hubble told us, Hubble is the reason why we are so confident now in gray matter being all around us. So we know that, sorry, dark matter. Uh, so we know that like, it is, pres it is presumed that like everything that like when is around us, like there's dark matter, like there's another entity or property that exists all around us at all times that we just don't perceive. It's always here. And Hubble is part of the reason why we know that as well. So. Wow. That's crazy. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I feel crazy. like just like what I just, I, there's just so much out there. But that's the thing that, okay. So here's what I was thinking. I was thinking like, okay. If we have to be off this galaxy in 4 billion years, a pretty good way to figure out how to do that is get to Mars. And then let's go a little further. And then let's go. Yeah. So like, and like a, in like a thousand years, we probably will have figured out how to like leap onto another galaxy or something. I don't know. But um, our problem is time. Time's a problem. The problem is that you can't. It just takes too long. Mm -hmm. And like the. Like, do people really get. Has anyone ever actually been frozen in space to go far? No, it's never really happened. That's just like sci-fi. Are you are like, you asking? Has anybody been cryogenically frozen and then revived in outer space? Yeah, the answer is no, right? I, th I think the answer is no. So, I mean, like, is that really what we would have to do, like in the movies? But no, man, Event know. Horizon. Do you even know how to do that? Event Horizon got it right. What you do is you bend space time until right. a certain point, and then you cross through. Except every now and then. You, you go to hell. hell. <laughs> so you just got to be careful not to do that. <laughs> Everyone's like having an orgy and eating each other at the same time. Really strange. Really <laughs> strange scene. That was a great movie though, right? Oh my God. Watch Event Horizon, friends. If you haven't, it's really good. Classic. Um, yeah. So uh, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. I don't know what NASA's up to lately. I think they mostly seeded outer space th stuff to SpaceX. Like it feels like SpaceX is super involved. I don't know how, but I, well, let's see. Who are those people who are Boeing? The Boeing apparently is in outer space now. Um, I mean, they shouldn't be. They should be worrying about their problems in, at home before they worry about their problems in space. Um, Boeing spaceship. I mean, if those people die in outer space, the stock's got to tank, right? I mean, yeah, it looks like they're, it says they're stuck in space due to multiple issues with Boeing Starliner. The window to re for a return flight is closing. I don't know what that means. Like, there's a sticky valve that left them stuck in space. Multiple issues. I mean. So it's the sticky valve? It says it's been delayed for the third time on Friday, June 21st, so this Friday. Um, they have no new return date. I mean. These can you two. imagine? Can you imagine being like the astronaut up there, and you Facetime your like wife, and like, what are you doing, honey? It's like nothing. It's like what? What's what's that behind you? And like, she's at like actively trying to buy a funeral plot for you. Mm -hmm. Actually, no. it's pointless because you're not going to come back. So, what does it matter? Oh, 100 percent. You're not going to get buried anywhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Never mind. I also like the kids. We talk about all the time about how many just like dead dogs are in space you know because like the russians were like we did it with Leica, but you're like no you didn't you did it with like a thousand other dogs first poor things poor, things. poor babies no. they have no idea they're just like in a thing like floating forever i mean the good news is they have no idea that nothing is gonna happen so like they're never gonna understand how bad their situation is that's the problem if you're in outer space like you know how bad it is yeah like, you that's know you're you not gonna avoid. get back yeah. These two are there together. Barry, Barry Wilmore and Sunita Williams. I hope you're listening.
do you get the internet up there? Download our podcast. It'll take a lot of your time. It'll distract you from the we fact that you're floating in space. We, we have, have so have much content, content, you guys. Like, you only you have 45 days, but at least two of those days can be constant doomed to fail episodes. I mean, your auction is going to run out way before our content will. <laughs> We're sorry because I'm sorry. you are very you are very brave. No, I don't brave. I mean, there's a fine line between brave and stupid. I mean, Stockton Rush was also brave, right? Yeah, I know. Um. Anyways, okay. th- that's my episode. That's my story. I'm sticking with it. Um. Please write to us at doomedafallpod at gmail dot com if you have other fun topics about space because it is. Man, once I started learning about the telescope and what it took pictures, of, I was like, it's. There's one picture, crazy, Taylor. Y'all. There's mm-hmm. a picture of it. It's like it's like a tiny picture, and it's from Hubble, and they say it captures two hundred fifty thousand galaxies. Like, what does that mean? What does that even, even mean? mean? God, I told you that one time we saw Starlink in the sky and we thought that it was under the world. Yeah, I saw. I was in L.A. I was in L.A. and I went to this one grocery store and I saw it and was like, oh, like we everybody just stopped. All traffic stopped. Everybody just looking into the sky. It was one of the first times they launched it was in 2016 or something. No, no, no. I've seen the launch, but I also saw the satellites. So you can see the satellite. There's like 15 dots in a row just like going across the sky at night. And the first time we saw it, we were like, this is it. They're here. Thank God, because I'm fucking ready for change. And um, but no, it was it was Starlink satellites, so you can like see them in a row, which is pretty cool. Can you see when they're supposed to launch? Uh, probably. My dad always sees. He lives by. He lives in Florida, and he can see like Cape Canaveral from his house. No, what? It's not that one. Whatever the one in Florida, and he um will take videos of it launching, which is super cool. Taylor, they're literally launching. At 8.47 Pacific today. Oh, well, I'll go outside. Yeah, from Van- Vandenberg Air Force. Wait, Vandenberg is called the Space Force Base? That's so much cooler. I know. They changed like a lot of things to Space Force recently, which also sounds cool. I met so, someone in Japan whose son works for Space Force, and I was like, that's cool. I mean, I, I will I will admit when when Trump was announcing Space Force at first, I was like, oh, my God, what? What what yeah. next? What we're going to wage war on dolphins next? Like, I don't get it. And then, you know, like now it's like you're seeing like Russia's planning nuclear bombs and shit in space. I'm like, OK, I'm like maybe there's a point. I don't we're, we are not getting to Mars. It's another it's another another check on the not getting to Mars side of the pros and cons of space yeah. we're going back to six and stones yeah. um yeah if you, um, go, if you go on spaceflightnow.com it'll give you all the launch schedules for uh, uh for spacex cool. and also one other fun fact you can go on a website which i'm going to tell you the name of in one second hold 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 please hold keep holding okay there it is so if you go on spacetelescopelive.org, tel- you okay. can actually see what the Hubble and Webb telescopes are looking at in that moment. Whoa. I mean, space sort of telescope. Live. Live. Dot org. Amazing. Cool. So, I want to show this to my children. Hold on. Let me write this down. Like right now, uh, Webb is fixated on a supermassive black hole. I get so scared. Yeah. Hubble's looking at stars. Oh, cool. So, anyways, that's my story. Taylor, is there anything you would like to say? Um, our website is up by the grace of God. I'm super stoked. Thank you, Jesus. I know. I'm so excited. So, the website is up. You can go to it and find all of our links to things. So very, very excited. Uh, what's the website? Doom to fail. Oh, all right. Doom to fail pod.com. <laughs> we're great at promotion. Correct. Um, <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks, Taylor. We'll go ahead and show this off and rejoin you all in a few days. Cool. Thanks, Farz. That was scary. Thanks, thanks. for your time. Thanks. <laughs> Bye.